With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This episode may contain explicit language. <laughs> Welcome to Karen Feeding, the show where we parent together. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer, contributor to Slate's Karen Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who's just a few days shy of 11. We live in Los Angeles. Hey, I'm Lucy Lopez. I host the Mamacita Rica podcast, Madre to Teen Dragon Amelia, who's 13, and my tween, Avery, who's 11. We live in Miami. Hey, I'm Zach Rosen. I host another podcast. It's called The Best Advice Show, and I am dad to Noah, who's six, and Ami, who's three, who's actually trying to walk in here right now. Ami, I'm sorry, I'll be right back. Today on the show, we'll answer a question from a listener about managing a possible ADHD diagnosis, especially when it comes to wrangling homework. Then you'll get to hear a special interview with a mom who faced a similar struggle and wrote a book about it. Elizabeth sits down with Australian author Sally Rippon to talk about Sally's book, Wild Things, how we learn to read and what can happen if we don't. We've been talking about education a lot recently, so we thought it was a perfect time to share this story about a neurodivergent kid in a school system overseas. We'll also share a round of recommendations. And then if you're in the Slate Plus Club, Sally and Elizabeth will continue their conversation. Here's what you'll hear if you have Slate Plus. And then there's the classic uh, Alison Lester, who in Australia we just revere. She's been writing and illustrating for a very long time, and all her books are just full of all the details of family life, often traveling around Australia or very iconic Australian things to do, like going to the beach or playing cricket on the beach, all these really lovely, sweet little family scenes. And she was one of our first Australian children's laureates, and she does a lot of work in Indigenous communities, just a really wonderful person. And I think if you wanted to understand what, um, I guess, an iconic feeling of Australia is, you can't go past Alison Lester. If you're listening on Slate Plus, thank you so much for your support, and we'll catch you later for your exclusive segment. If you're not listening on Slate Plus, we hope you'll consider it. There's no better way to support the show. And when you're a member, you also get ad-free listening on all Slate podcasts. Sounds great, right? We think so too. Go to slate.com slash care plus for more info. All right, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll see you back here in a moment. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. BetterHelp has helped me in so many ways. It's provided me a supportive space to explore coping strategies. It's uh, taught me how to prioritize self-care. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give better BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash care and feeding today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash care and feeding. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity, much like how their Progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, and even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. 
We're back. Let's start with our question. This came from a listener who left us a voicemail. Hi, Karen Feeding Podcast. My stepdaughter, who I have known for her whole life, has been exhibiting signs of ADHD since she was in preschool. She's now in third grade, and she's a great student, but it takes her a longer time to complete schoolwork and homework than her classmates. Our main struggle as a family is homework. My stepdaughter's teacher asks kids to spend 30 minutes a night on homework, but because my stepdaughter works slowly, she often brings unfinished classwork home in addition to the assigned homework. So it's not unusual for her to spend an hour or two on homework on a given night at our house. Her mom thinks she shouldn't have homework at all at this age, so it causes a lot of tension among us. I know one to two hours is a lot, but my stepdaughter just needs more time. Without this much time on homework, she would fall behind. I'm looking for tips on supporting her in increasing her focus and on getting through homework more quickly and, in general, just solutions to this tension and these issues. Thank you. All right. Uh, what do you think, Lucy? Well, um, I want to start by saying that um, my daughters do not have ADHD, but I feel that obviously there's there's like several things you could do to support your stepdaughter to help reduce, you know, the stress, the tension within the family during the dreaded homework hour. Um, I do find it helpful when we do the following for Avery. Um, during homework time, we help her break down her homework assignments into smaller, more manageable tasks. And it's less overwhelming, not just for her, but thank thankfully for us. And it helps her stay focused. Like if she has to do, you know, if three hours of iReady, which is a reading program that you have to do on the computer, is due on Friday, we'll do 20 minutes on Monday, 20 minutes on Tuesday, yada, yada. You know, just like minimize it so she's not overwhelmed at the moment. And another thing we we encourage during homework is we call them shake it off breaks. Uh, during homework, I, I have her stretch. I have her move around. Like when I see that the task is completely overwhelming her, I've literally done a dance break in the middle of everything. And it helps her release any kind of anxious energy she may be feeling in the moment. And Like you're encouraging her to dance. Yes, I'm uh -huh. like, hey, I, I go, hey, um, swear, she'll, she'll, she gets very frustrated with math, and I'm like, get up, get up, let's do a little dance. Show me what there's like this new dance on TikTok. I'm like, show that dance to me again, and we'll do it like a couple of times. I'm like, all right, let's go back to the math homework, and then not only does she come back in a better mood, but it, it helps her improve her focus, like yeah. just moving around, getting up, walking around. I cannot tell you how many times during homework I have asked her, hey. Why don't you go upstairs, take a quick shower, and come back? You're gonna feel better, and we'll finish this homework then. Um, and I, I understand you may or may not have the time for those kind of shake it off breaks, but try it. I, it may, it may work for you in your in your situation. What about you, Zach? What do you think? Well, a couple things. You said that she's been exhibiting signs of ADHD, but has she been tested? If not, it's time to get her tested, um, because of course there's all sorts of therapies that you can introduce um you know if, if you get that diagnosis and and even if not there's there's all sorts of things you can do like the dance break i love there's meditation there's exercise but then you know there's like brain training therapy there's medication and if she does actually have adhd then she should be treated for it and that's going to help a, a lot um i think that's super important um and then i think just speaking to the interpersonal stuff between mom and stepmom and dad, y'all just have to be on the same page and have like a uniform strategy. Um, Cause if she's going to one house and getting and having one set of expectations for how to do her work and then going somewhere else and having a completely different set of expectations, that's just gonna disorient her more, I would think. And so the parents need to have a tough conversation and kind of figure out a plan together. What do you think, Jamila? I agree. I definitely think it's time for an evaluation. You don't wanna just go on speculating that your child has ADHD. But to warn you, these evaluations can take a very long time because we had Naima evaluated in November. Uh, I think it took- This past November? Whole, this past November. Uh -huh. I think she went in for two, three hour sessions and maybe one one hour session and they're evaluating her for all sorts of things, you know, and ADHD was among them. And mm -hmm. we still haven't gotten the results back. 
Um, wow. We were told it would take a month. And when I reached out last month, they said we're still working on it. It'll be a few more weeks. I think the evaluation place is backed up. It's very hard to find somewhere that will evaluate your child for ADHD. It's, it's not easy at all. It was a very tedious process. So I would say get on that um, as soon as possible. And, you know, it's it's easy to say you and the step you and the mom and the dad shall be on the same page, but um, that can be difficult, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially if you and the mom are not in direct communication or you don't feel comfortable, you know, um, saying things to her. But do be mindful that mom has an anti homework attitude. So I don't know if that means that she's and I as somebody who's anti homework, I get it. But I don't know if that means that she's not making your stepdaughter do the homework or if she's, you know, complaining about it along with her or commiserating with her, which leaves the stepdaughter to feel more empowered to say this isn't important. Um, so just make sure that you're balancing out that messaging, you know, by saying homework is just part of going to school. It may not be our favorite part, but it's something that's necessary and it can help our brains grow and to try to have a positive and affirming attitude about homework to, you know, try and balance out what she may be hearing from her mom. Do you think it's worth reaching out to the teacher too? I think so. Um, you know, one of the things that you do when you're going to have your child evaluated for ADHD, there's a form that they ask for, you know, both parents, if both parents are involved, to fill out their, you know, observations, as well as the child's teacher. So you'll need to let them know that this is a concern you're having. And then what was interesting for us is that Naima's dad and I, who both have ADHD, witnessed all these ADHD behaviors in Naima, but her teacher did not. You know, mm -hmm. which means that her behavior in the classroom is somewhat different than her behavior at home. Hmm. So you may find that, you know, what she's struggling with, with you all, it could be a different case in class. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for leaving us a voicemail. We appreciate when you send your questions our way. With that, it's time to hear Elizabeth's interview with Australian author and parent to a neurodivergent kid, Sally Rippon. I want to talk about the insights you have gained about children learning to read. And I think you come from this incredible perspective because you are a children's book author. Like, who should know more about how children read? And through the book, we find out that, like, you actually didn't, there was a lot you didn't know, and you learned a ton. So can you share some of the things that you've learned on this journey? So you're right. I'm a children's author. And not only that, my mother was a teacher. So when we grew up, we moved around a lot because of my dad's job. And the number one thing my mom was able to do for us was to give us books. And we, so we grew up in Southeast Asia. We spent a lot of time in hotel rooms. And so she would give us books to read. And then when we'd read all of the books that we were able to carry with us, she would give us pencils and paper and we would make our own books. Mm. So I think I've really been writing and illustrating books ever since I was very, very young. And it was something that came very easily to me. I know that my mother would have engaged me within with conversation. Um, we were lucky enough to have her home with us when we were very little, and she was very um, she was very imaginative. So we always had a craft corner, and she was always getting us to involved in the activities that she was doing as well. So these are all great things to to get kids ready to learn to read. So lots of conversations at home lots of talking about the activities that you're doing and all of those things she was doing instinctively and also through her education as having been a teacher for a long time. So I believe that I picked up reading before I started school. It was a very easy thing for me. And I assumed that that same thing would happen for my children. And for my two older sons, that was the case. They learned to read very easily. Their father is French, so they also learned to read in two languages. And so I just assumed that the way we learn to read is you give your kids enough books um, you know, infuse them in beautiful literature and eventually it would just click. And a lot of people still believe that. And for some children, it's lucky enough that that can happen. But that didn't happen with my younger son. So he got to about seven or eight years old and it still wasn't clicking. So all the other students in his classroom were moving ahead from the school readers onto more engaging books. And he was starting to notice that everyone else mm -hmm. was getting ahead and he was really plateauing. And it started to affect his self-esteem, of course. So he was saying things like, I hate books, I hate reading, and then, of course, I hate school. And for a children's author, that's a terrible thing to hear. 
And so I was racking my brains, you know, what can I do? What can I do? And my first solution was to write a series of books that I thought he'd like to read. And so I started writing a series of books that I think are also available in, in America called Billy B. Brown. They and they are. were using the library reader. <laughs> and they were, I would test everything out on him. I would check to see that he was engaged and he was following and he was able to understand what was going on. And I thought, great, now he'll become a reader. But of course, this didn't happen. And I now know why, because he then got to high school. And what happens is, if it, within the first three years of your education, you don't acquire the proper reading skills that you need to then go on to learn, you will never, ever catch up unless you get that really intensive learning right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because the first three years are dedicated to learning to read, whereas after that, we're reading to learn. Mm -hmm. And so he just completely slipped by the wayside and his self-esteem started to plummet. Um, his behavior started to change. And of course, by the time he got to high school, it was a disaster because then there's organizational issues as well. And his behavior really got very bad. So I started to research what should have been done differently. I knew that he was struggling to read and we just assumed that that was dyslexia, but I didn't really understand the importance of early intervention. And what I now know, and this was mind blowing for me when I first learned this, is that we're not born with brains primed to read. We're born with brains that are primed to speak and to also understand the language that we're hearing from within the womb, but our brains need to be rewired. Mm. And this is something that has to happen with a specific type of teaching. Um, there are lots of ways of calling it, but often it's just known as phonics, which is really breaking the words down into a code. And what happens is your child learns that code then it rewires a part of their brain and so that it becomes automatic. So then it looks like we're not breaking the words down anymore because it happens so quickly and so seamlessly. But if we don't get taught that way, and then for then on, we will never have that rewiring. And it doesn't mean that we can't be taught later on. But of course, once your child gets older, they're learning a whole lot of other stuff and they don't want to be pulled out of class to do um, you know, other uh, intervention methods. So the quicker we can get onto this and the quicker that we can see if our child is not learning to read and give them necessary intervention early on, the less chance they will have to fall behind. So all children can benefit from learning from phonics. Some will pick it up easily like I did and my older boys did and, it, and maybe they don't necessarily need that really explicit phonics teaching. But every child in the classroom can benefit from it, particularly those who may be neurodivergent or may have reading difficulties. So what we're trying to do here in Australia is just really, I guess, uh, revamp the whole system so that if every child is taught phonics within the classroom, then all children have the opportunities to succeed because you can't really succeed at school without literacy. Everything requires reading. It doesn't matter if it's maths or science or reading a, a manual on how to fix a car. You know, Everything requires reading. So if your child hasn't learnt those skills by the time they finish primary school, they're really in trouble. And that's what happened for my son. He really, really had a terrible time at high school. Yeah, we did an interview series um, probably about a year ago based on this podcast called Sold a Story because a lot of the teaching, I'm sure you're familiar, in the United States um, has been based on this this other method of reading, which is not phonics. <laughs> it is like, make reading fun. <laughs> and it's like, well, that's great, but it's not actually teaching what you're talking about. The the like, how do we read? So we had Henry, our oldest, who just read. Like you said, we presented him with books. We read to him. And one day he read. Uh, and it was like, I'm a great reading teacher. Then I had my middle child who has ADHD and is neurodivergent. And all of a sudden it was like, no matter what I do, it's just not everything is just so much harder, right? He has to be explicitly taught each letter sound and the blends. And then what I found for my third child is he was so frustrated that everyone else could read um, that what he needed was the instruction from us in the phonics to be like, look, we all started just making the sounds because he thought, well, everyone's a, like a fluent reader. You know, he could make the sounds, but it didn't make a word, you know, it didn't easily make a word. <laughs> and so to say, like, I, I like the parts of the book that sort of say this isn't inherent, like this, that's something I actually read the six year old something from your book to be like, look at this book for adults that is saying this is something you have to learn. And it's hard. It is just hard. Um, and we're going to do it and we're going to do it together. But it's not easy. 
And I do think many of us have been led to believe that everyone will just learn to read. If presented with books, they will learn to read. And so in some ways, to be let off the hook of like, hey, it's not easy for everyone. Uh, And it's okay if it's hard. I have a friend whose seven-year-old is really struggling with reading. They have sent her in for educational evaluation. What advice would you have for her about next steps? So she feels like the school is is aware and looking at it, but like what should she be doing? So first of all, yes, the Sold a Story podcast is incredible and actually made me cry when I listened to it. I think not only does it let children off the hook to let them recognize that Everybody needs to learn this way. It's just that some people will pick it up more quickly than others. It's like learning the piano. You can't just sit down and play an incredible piece of music unless you learn what the keys are and how chords come together. It's Reading's exactly the same. And I know that the people that talk about the whole language thing as being the fun way to learn to read, they don't really recognize that it's not fun if you're sat in a corner and said, okay, now it's reading time. And you can't read. You actually feel terrible about yourself. So you're right, it's really important for kids to know that it isn't something we're born with, that some people will have a more natural affinity to pick it up than others. The same as, you know, my son's very mathematical. I'm terrible at math. (laughs) We don't feel ashamed to say that. We don't feel ashamed to say, I'm not good at math. But if we say, I'm not good at reading, there's a lot of shame attached to that. It affects our self-esteem so much more than anything else we study at school. But not only does it let children off the hook. It lets parents off Mm -hmm. the hook because the amount of parents I meet, including myself, that beat themselves up because they think, you know, what have I done wrong? I've read to my child every night. I've done all the right things. They've grown up in a house of books. These were all the things that I was told that you needed to have a proficient reader. It's not your fault. They weren't taught how to read. Reading needs to be taught. It's as simple as that. And you can tell your friends that, of course, there's things you can do at home to prepare your child to be a reader, reading with them, making books something that is fun and reading aloud, of course, should never stop for the longest time that you can do that. That's a joyful experience that you can have with your children, audio books, all of those things, really, really great to prime children for stories and for them to create empathy because stories is a really great way to access learning about empathy. But the actual act of reading needs to be taught. So if she wants to do some things at home, there are some now some really great online programs that you can download. But I think what was happening with re- me with my son is because I was trying to do so much of this myself, it was affecting my relationship with him. It was making us really upset with each other all the time. And so I think if you can find the right teacher outside of the home, and if you're homeschooling, that is you, of course, as well. But if she does have somebody else that can take on that role, a little bit like teaching a teenager how to drive, yeah. you know, if you can get a driving instructor to deal with that, it's so much easier because you don't have to have the tantrums and they're much better behaved with a driving instructor. But then what you can do at home is just to remind them that they're, once you get over this hurdle, this really, really difficult part, it is difficult for a lot of kids, then there's the joy of stories to be found and you can create that at home, sitting with them, in the evening or whatever your special time is and sharing stories, that's how you can remind them that all this hard work pays off in the end. Just as listening to beautiful music makes you think, aha, all these piano uh, lessons that I'm taking will eventually get me there. So she can certainly do that support at home, but I think it sounds like what she's doing already and that she's finding the intervention she needs is really, really fantastic because the quicker you can get onto it and the quicker you can get the support you need. And just to check that what her child is being taught is is explicit phonics, um, then they should be fine. I mean, some children will require a lot more repetitive learning. So I've now worked out that with my younger son, he often will want to do something two or three times till he feels like it's fully integrated. So letting children do things at their own pace as well. I think often we have this idea when things should be achieved, you know, whether it's gross, you know, hallmarks (laughs) or whether it's it's, um, educational ones. You know, they will do it in their own time and they may do it in their own weird way. Like my son, who's really good at maths, he does maths backwards. I don't even know how he works it out, but he comes up with the answer and then kind of goes backwards. So they they need to know that their way is also valid, that they're not wrong. They're perfect as they are. And we just need to find a way to support them to achieve their potential. Absolutely. Like, what are you telling yourself? How are you coaching yourself in these moments? Because I find... 
I know all of this, right? Like I've read all these books, we do these interviews, I give this advice. But in the moment with these children, it can be so hard to remind myself, I think because I feel the fear of like, I'm 40, I know what life, if you continue to to do this or don't learn this thing looks like. What do you do to push that fear down and say, my goal is to make sure he feels loved or my goal is to make sure that our mental health is intact? Like, how are you calming your own mom fear, mom guilt to be in that moment with him? So I said that we need a community for our kids, but we also need a community for us moms. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> vital. And I think that's the mistake I made in the beginning is somehow I was so ashamed that as a children's author, I was bringing up a child that couldn't read, that somehow I felt like I had to hide that from the world. And I didn't reach out for support. And I really, I spent too much time trying to do it on my own. And it wasn't until I reached out to a community of other parents in similar situations that one, I found a huge amount of incredibly helpful advice but also just support because I was comparing my children to friends that had kids that, you know, were doing, looked like they were just breezing through life. And I had a boy that was really struggling. And so then in turn, I was as well. But it wasn't until I tapped into a greater community of parents of children with learning difficulties or disabilities or neurodivergency that I felt less alone and I felt supported. And sometimes it's, ex- it's exhausting and sometimes you're going to mess up. And that's the same with your kids. And isn't that a great way to role model to them? that sometimes you can mess up and you can own it and you can recognize that you make, made a mistake and you can do the repair work. What a gift to teach that to your children by actually doing it. And when my son and I were in lockdown, sometimes we would butt heads and we would get into arguments and we would both have to go into our rooms and calm down and I would come back and I'd say, I don't feel like I handled that very well. Can we try again? And that was such a gift for him to learn because I wasn't taught that growing mm-hmm. up. I was taught that, you know, if you feel upset with someone, you either shut yourself down and you don't say anything or you lose your temper and then the relationship is scarred indefinitely. But no, the most loving supportive relationships are ones that can with, with, with that can actually hold on to conflict and grow stronger from it. And I think if we can teach our children that that is a safe, loving space and how to do healthy conflict, and, and then if you feel like you have done the wrong thing or hurt someone, that you can still repair that. What an incredible gift that we give to the world to bring young men into the world that are emotionally aware and who can recognize that you can make a mistake and own up to it and then do the repair work. I think that's that's what we can model and that's also what we can teach our children. And I think not beating ourselves up. The first draft I wrote of my book was so angsty and it was a lot of kind of catharsis and just, oh, I did all these things wrong. I'm such a terrible mother. And then each draft that I rewrote and rewrote, I was kinder and kinder to myself. And I thought, yeah, there's some things I would have done differently. And isn't it great that I know better now? And I think we need to do that for ourselves as much as teach that to our kids. Yeah. And you share all of that with us. I mean, there's even a section of the book, basically, that is like, here's what I wish I had done, (laughs) which I mean, what better to me? It's like that on my journey is what I want to share with other people. Like, this is the stuff I didn't know and learned the hard way. And if you don't have to learn it the way I did, great. That would be great. You're going to learn your own lessons and hopefully you can share those. I wanted to pick out, there's one other piece of advice. I mean, there's so much advice, but one that really stuck with me where you talk about the importance of honesty with your son and him being able to be honest with you. And there's this moment, I think maybe you're in the car or something, and he says like, if you want me to be honest with you, I have to trust that you're not going to freak out. And I just feel like we talk so much about the importance of being honest and having our children feel that they can tell us anything. But we play a big part of that with our reactions. How are you doing with that now? Do you have advice on how we can all be better at that? That was such a steep learning curve for me, particularly because, you know, young children, they, oh, the trouble that they can get up to is nothing like the trouble that teenagers can get up to. And my son was making some pretty poor choices. And that was scary for me, you know, because teenagers, if they they go off the rails, they can go off quite badly. And so I was really, really scared. And so I was letting my fear become very reactive. And so, of course, it got to the place that my son didn't want to tell me things because he didn't want to upset me. And it was actually my sister who'd studied psychology that reminded me that. She said, 
he's not telling you things, not because he's lying or wanting to hurt you, but more the opposite, that he doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to see you upset. He loves you. And that was such a wake-up call for me where I recognized, all right, I need to work on my reactivity. And it happened over time. It was a He really had to trust that if he was going to tell me things, that I was going to be there and be able to listen to him. Um, one, not judge him, but also not jump to conclusions and also not react in a way that made it all about me. Because if your children can come to you when they're in trouble and they can tell you where they've messed up or a friend is in trouble, that is such a gift because then you can help them. Yeah. But if they think, oh, mum's going to be so upset with me, I'm not going to tell her. That's when kids get into trouble. So it's something you can practice when your kids are young is to, you know, to own when they've made mistakes. And also I think that goes back to the idea of recognising that you can make mistakes too, that sometimes you can make decisions that weren't wise and you need to fix that. And so I think that modelling is important too because I think we can really hold ourselves to too high a standard as parents and, and think that this is something that we should know how to do instinctively. We're learning on the job and it's the hardest thing we'll ever do. And there's so much pressure because this is this is not like writing an assignment for English or something like that. This is somebody's life. And so the burden of that feels pretty heavy at times. But there's more and more research coming out to say that there's a lot of who your child is that is just going to be who they are. And we can be a fantastic influence on them, but we can't necessarily make them into who we think they should be. And so I think the sooner we can see our beautiful children as individuals in the world and learn who they are and what they need to support them, one, the more that they will feel free to develop into their true selves, but also the less we'll beat ourselves up because we'll think this is just who they are. You know, I'm doing the best that I can to help this person be who they are in the world rather than who I think they should be. And so, yeah, it's not easy. It's a really hard thing to do, but it's also okay to admit that to your kids when you're struggling. I'm, I'm really struggling with this. I'm, I'm having a hard time. Can you tell me what I can do differently or how I can do better? And you know, they can be really kind. They can give you really beautiful advice around that. Yeah, they're they're so honest. <laughs> like they're able to be honest. Yeah. What do you hope readers take take away from your book? Like what was your when when you sat down, what were you thinking? This is what I want to convey. I think what you have given me already so far, Elizabeth, is exactly what I hope is um feeling less alone, feeling connected, feeling someone sees and understands them. And, you know, the thing that you said um, about becoming playful around it, actually detaching from the anxiety that parenting can create and just trying to lift out of it, not beat yourself up so much, not beat your kids up emotionally so much about it. All of the things that you talked about, what you got from the book is everything that I could have hoped. I think for me, the book is the one that I needed when my mm -hmm. son started school. And so I really was writing to my younger self. Um, you're okay. You're doing the best job you can. Your son is this beautiful person who will get through this really challenging time and be a lovely young man in the world, which I'm happy to report he is. You know, he didn't end up uh, finishing school, but he has the most beautiful, deep emotional intelligence. And he's now studying short courses and very practical skills. And I feel confident that there's a lovely young man in the world. And, and I turn the Titanic around. I feel like it's the thing I'm most proud of. So the other thing that I hope that parents can take away is it's never too late. Mm. I didn't really start putting this amount of work in until my son was already a teenager and really already, I guess, going off the rails, to to, to be honest. And so I was really panicking. And, and it would have been very easy to think it's all too late. This train is heading down that track. But it's never too late. You can always build, rebuild or build a connection with your child, help them feel loved and seen and supported and turn some of this around at any stage. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway is that, you know, you can always be that person that your child needs at any stage in their life. And a lot of it, I think, is is managing your, yourself. And so, you know, I did get a lot of therapy myself. I studied psychotherapy for a couple of years so I could know better how to support kids, but also to recognize what was going on in me much more and, and to be much more self-regulated myself. So, um yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is you're not alone. You know, there there are plenty of us out there. I love that because I feel like I have had more than one text conversation with mom friends where I'm like, 
and they're echoing back to me like, am I actually raising sociopaths? Like, like truly, is this going to be okay? And Because we have these moments, particularly with these wild things. And so being able to reframe that, have the empathy and to say like, no, we can continue to pour into them and change our methods and look at what we're doing um, to, to feel like we have done the best that we can, right? That we are are trying to see them for who they are and set them on a path. Um, I mean, I have just recommended this book to so many people. If it, it feels like if you're if you're not sure what's going on or you're <laughs> you're thinking like, do I need a friend group? Do I need therapy on this? Does my child need something? This is like a great place to start, like to feel seen. Um, I there's this moment that I have to talk about in the book where your child gets a hundred on the test and I cried reading it because it, it's different milestones for me with my kids, but I so empathize with that moment that it that the clouds clear, right? Not forever. This is one test, but just these little signs that like we are going to be okay. Like all of this is working. <laughs> and I think thank you. That's such a beautiful thing for you to say. And that was a really monumental period of of time and that was a really just a little spark of hope that I needed at that time but I think one of the the other things that I really made sure I did was also interview adults that are now living living successful lives as neurodivergent people in the world and the thing that's really important for parents and children to remember is school is only one small part of their lives you are a much bigger influence than school will ever be but also they will come out the other side of this and they will go on to be extraordinary people in the world. I mean, neurodivergent people are highly sought after in a lot of workplaces because they have very unique thinking skills. They have really unique ways of seeing, problem solving. Um, school is just a very antiquated system of teaching very basic things that our children will need through life. It's 100 years old. It hasn't been updated. And so what I also really hope, and I talk now around Australia, I've been talking in a lot of schools about adapting an educational system that fits the individual more Mm. than trying to crush a child to fit into an antiquated education system. So I think it's really important that kids and you get the big picture that this is one part of their life and when they're in the middle of it, it can feel like a life sentence. So remind them that this is only a small part of who they are and help them find something within those years that makes them feel good about themselves. They might be great at table tennis or they might be great at drawing. Help them find something that can make them feel good about themselves. If they're turning up every day to school and feeling like a failure, make sure you find another aspect of their lives where they can shine. I think that's really important to remember too. You can find Sally Rippon's book, Wild Things, and all of her books for young readers on Amazon and wherever you get books. There's a link in the show notes. As always, listeners, we want to hear from you. What do you think about how we learn to read? Do you have a kid who struggles with homework? Share your thoughts with us by emailing karenfeedingpod at slate.com or by leaving us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. We're always curious to know what you think. We're going to take one more break and see you back here for recommendations. We all have that friend who wakes up early to go get everyone McDonald's breakfast while the rest of us sleep in. This is your sign to thank them. And if you're that friend, this is us saying thank you. Just a friendly reminder that right now, get any size iced coffee before 11 a.m. for just 99 cents. And a satisfying sausage McMuffin with egg is just $2.79. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. All right, it's time for recommendations. Lucy, what are you recommending? Listen, it's Women's History Month, and my girls and I took a deep dive into a site hosted by the Library of Congress, uh, womenshistorymonth.gov. We scrolled around and came across a bunch of like great videos and articles and photos on various strong women throughout American history, and one in particular mm. that caught our attention because this is a house full of wannabe artists, is, um, <laughs> was uh, Shakai Booker and her tire art. It's just 
breathtaking. We learned how she hmm. sees the different colors of tire rubber and how they reminded her of the different skin tones of black bodies, how they reminded her of African design motifs, how she tears up these tires and then like makes these sculptures. Whoa. She's been doing this since the 80s. She dresses literally like a warrior. Her like this giant turban oh. with like her hair and I mean, she's a fabulous, um, you know, artist, and we would have never learned about her if we didn't click on womanshistorymonth.gov. I, she's so badass. I would totally uh, recommend that website, especially if you have, you know, young, strong, you know, strong little girls in your family that want to learn about other women who are doing great things. Check it out. Really cool exhibition on, on like, everything. So good. Wow, her work is amazing. I haven't seen this before. I just Google image searched it. Oh, it was so great. And then she, awesome. she also has this whole, like, like her sculptures are literally made out of tires. She's been doing it yeah. since the 80s. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, her her feelings about, you know, pollution and the environment. Um, but the sculptures are just breathtaking. Check it out. So cool. Very cool. Yeah. Zach, what are you recommending? I am recommending School of Rock, the movie from 2003. Have you guys seen that? Yes, I haven't. It's it's Jack Black at his absolute best. I think it's yeah. it's him working at the peak of his powers of like wacky charm. Beyond that, the premise, if you don't know, it's about Jack Black, who's uh, a wannabe rock star who hasn't made it, and he needs some money and uh, basically pretends to be his roommate so he can get a job as a substitute teacher at this really prestigious private school. And he goes and instead of teaching the kids what they're supposed to be teaching them. He teaches them rock history and how to play in a band. And the movie climaxes with them performing in this battle of the bands. It's it's heartwarming. It's great. Noah loved it. Um, it's a great way to introduce your kids to like ACDC and Stevie Nicks if they don't yet know who those um, giants are. So School of Rock holds up pretty well. It's And also, if you, if you know White Lotus, um, the HBO show, it's written and directed by the same person, Mike White, who's also in it. Um, Jamila, what have you got? So I'm recommending a book that I'm reading right now called The 50-50 Solution, the surprisingly simple choice that makes moms, dads, and kids happier after a split uh, by Emma Johnson. Um, And what she's advocating for is for parents who are not together to aim for an equitable division of parenting labor and financial responsibility with their children. Um, As many of you all know, Naima's Mm -hmm. dad and I divide her time evenly. Uh, Neither of us receive child support at this point. You know, we are sharing in the raising of her. Um, I think it's going pretty well. And it's something I would like for other parents to consider. Um, You know, I posted about this on Instagram and I just asked, I was like, you know, how many moms would consider having, you know, their, their child's father have their kid more frequently? you know um and i was really surprised and excited to see that a number of families you know in my replies are already doing this kind of thing and there were definitely mothers who said if i had to sort of co-parent who could do that i would love to do it and there were fathers who you know talked about enjoying more time with their children than the you know traditional every other weekend arrangement um that is so common amongst separated parents yeah co-parenting i i would hope is like the norm nowadays. So it's good to hear it probably is. It's not yet, Mm -hmm. you know, I think there's like 75% of single moms raising children without a father's Mm -hmm. um, participation, Mm -hmm. but, and nobody's tracking like, there's just a lot of data that is not available about the lives of single parents you know i'm really interested in knowing particularly about black women how many mothers are raising their children completely by themselves how many are raising children with fathers that participate how many are raising children with fathers that have the kid half the time you know there's just so much more inquiry that we need into the lives of separated parents but it does seem that the tide is turning and more families are embracing you know an equitable division um, of labor i love that so we always want to hear what you're loving listeners seriously be sure to reach out 
let us know what you're into and keep the conversation going. And that's our show. Please subscribe, leave a rating and review and tell your friends. This episode of Care and Feeding is produced by Maura Curry with special thanks to Rosemary Belson. Shasha Leonard is the voice of our listeners. Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Slate Audio. For Lucy Lopez and Zach Rosen, I'm Jamil Lemieux. Thank you for listening. When we made our McDonald's spicy chicken McNuggets, you were praise hands emoji. Then we ran out and you were streaming tears emoji. Now they're back, so you can be grinning face with sweat emoji. Order ahead on the McDonald's app. And get money mouth face emoji with two orders of crispy, irresistible 10-piece McNuggets. Spicy or classic for just $6. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.